Welcome to Oxalate in the Kidneys, Primary Hydroxylurea in Practice. This is an exhibitor spotlight at Kidney Week 2020 Reimagined, sponsored by El Nylon Pharmaceuticals. My name is Michelle Baum. I'm a pediatric nephrologist from Boston Children's Hospital. These are the disclosures today. Our objectives today are to understand the role of oxalate as a key molecule in the pathophysiology of primary hyperoxaluria. We will learn about the burden patients with primary hyperoxaluria experience and the need for effective treatments. And we will discuss the importance of intervention to decrease oxalate accumulation. Today, we will start with discussing the physiology of primary hyperoxaluria. This will be followed by a talk on demystifying primary hyperoxaluria. We have a pre-recorded question and answer session. And lastly, you will see videos from patients and their families with discussion following those videos. I hope you enjoy this session today. This session is on pinpointing the pathophysiology of primary hyperoxaluria. Why does it occur? Oxalate arises from a variety of dietary and endogenous sources and is considered an end product of human metabolism. Normally, only a small fraction of ingested oxalate is absorbed, ranging from 5 to 10 percent. Therefore, the majority of plasma oxalate is derived from endogenous hepatic production. Any oxalate that's absorbed from the diet or is endogenously produced is delivered to the kidney where it is filtered and excreted as urinary oxalate. In enteric hyperoxaluria, there is increased colonic absorption due to GI abnormalities resulting in malabsorption. Malabsorption leads to increased delivery of fat to the colon where it binds dietary calcium, and this decreases the ability of dietary calcium to bind to the oxalate in the gut, and increased soluble oxalate is then absorbed. In addition, bile salts and fatty acid increase intestinal permeability and further facilitate oxalate absorption into the blood. This leads to increase in plasma oxalate, which is excreted into the kidney, increasing urinary oxalate and increasing the risk of kidney stone formation. Primary hyperoxaluria results in in from increased hepatic production of oxalate, and we'll discuss that physiology next. This slide will delineate the pathophysiology of primary hyperoxaluria in the liver. On the left is a hepatocyte. The enzymes involved in primary hyperoxaluria are in red, AGXT, GRHPR, and HOGA1. Deficiency of AGXT, which converts glyoxylate to glycine, results in increased glyoxylate, which is converted by LDH to oxalate. This is primary hyperoxaluria type 1. In primary hyperoxaluria type 2, the enzyme involved is GRHPR. GRHPR encodes for glyoxylate reductase. Deficiency of GRHPR leads to accumulation of glyoxylate and hydroxypyruvate. Glyoxylase is converted to oxalate by LDH. Hydroxypyruvate is converted by LDH to L-glycerate. In primary hyperoxaluria type 3, the HOGA1 enzyme is involved in catalyzing cleavage of hydroxy to oxyglutarate into pyruvate and glyoxylate. Deficiency of this enzyme results in primary hyperoxaluria type 3, but the exact mechanism by which oxalate overproduction occurs in primary hyperoxaluria type 3 is not yet completely understood. On the right side of the slide, you can see that primary hyperoxaluria type 1 is the most common in about 80% of cases, and type 2 and type 3 have about a 10% incidence. Based on the pathways we just discussed in the hepatocyte and the metabolites that might be elevated in primary hyperoxaluria in addition to oxalate, you can send a random urine sample for testing for a hyperoxaluria panel. Primary hyperoxaluria can be suggested if oxalate and one of these additional metabolites is elevated. 
So the primary hyperoxyuria panels can help determine the type of primary hyperoxyuria depending on which metabolite is elevated. Glycolate, glycerate, and HOG can be elevated in type 1, type 2, and type 3, respectively. In primary hyperoxyuria type 1, glycolate is often elevated, but in some cases, only the oxalate is elevated. Kidney stones are common in patients with primary hyperoxyuria. This slide delineates kidney stone events in patients with primary hyperoxyuria adapted for, from a 2015 paper by Tang. Overall, 58% of patients have passed a kidney stone with a mean of 0.3 kidney stones passed each year, translating to approximately one stone every 3.3 years. One or more urologic procedures were required by about 70% of patients with a mean of 0.15 procedures per year. Those patients who have nephrocalcinosis with primary hyperoxyuria have an increased risk of having end-stage kidney disease. This slide is adapted from a paper by Tang in 2015 and demonstrates in blue that patients without nephrocalcinosis have a decreased risk of kidney failure over uh, years, up to 20 years. Those patients who present with nephrocalcinosis after their first imaging have a higher incidence of kidney failure. And next, those patients who had nephrocalcinosis on their initial imaging also have a high incidence of end-stage kidney disease. Urinary oxalate is a key risk factor for kidney failure in primary hyperoxyuria. Those with the highest urinary oxalate excretion have an increased risk of end-stage kidney disease. This graph is adapted by a paper from 2016 by Zhao and shows the correlation of urinary oxalate at diagnosis on kidney survival over 30 years. In blue, you can see that those with the highest level of urinary oxalate exceeding 2.4 millimoles per 1.73 meters squared have the lowest kidney survival compared to the other quartiles. This slide delineates kidney failure in primary hyperoxyuria type 1 and type 2. It also looks at the mutations in type 1 that are associated with pyridoxine sensitivity in the homozygous form as well as the heterozygous form. Kidney survival is on the y-axis and aging years is on the x-axis. In blue, you can see that patients with primary hyperoxyluria type 2 have the longest kidney survival with end-stage renal disease occurring later in life. Patients with pyridoxine sensitivity either in the homozygous form or partially in the heterozygous form also have higher kidney survival compared to those patients who have other mutations that are non-pyridoxine sensitive in primary hyperoxyuria type 1 seen in the pink. As the GFR declines below 45 mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared, renal excretion cannot keep up with oxalate production and it becomes important to follow plasma oxalate levels. This slide delineates the association between plasma oxalate quartile and rate of end-stage kidney disease in patients with different CKD stages. On the x-axis are levels of plasma oxalate quartile, and on the y-axis is end-stage kidney disease rates. At each of the stages of CKD, patients with the highest quartile of plasma oxalate have the highest rate of end-stage kidney disease. This is important. We'll talk about following the plasma oxalate levels as patients develop CKD, as this helps you to determine when dialysis needs to be initiated. I'll be talking about demystifying primary hyperoxyluria. In our clinic, we consider a genetic or rare disease as a cause of a kidney stone if we see that there's early onset of disease, so a particularly young patient presents with kidney stones. 
if there's familial prevalence, so a pa patient and their siblings or parents may present with kidney stones. If there's consanguinity of the parents, as this leads to higher incidence of autosomal recessive disorders. If the patient has had recurrent kidney stones, or if there's nephrocalcinosis. Additionally, if your patient with kidney stones presents with reduced kidney function or end-stage renal disease associated with kidney stones or nephrocalcinosis, it's important to consider a genetic cause of the kidney stone disease. There are challenges in primary hyperoxaluria diagnosis as often physicians don't think about the diagnosis in patients with kidney stones. And so there are often significant delays in the diagnosis of patients with primary hyperoxaluria long after they might have presented with their initial stone. So the age of diagnosis of primary hyperoxaluria has a wide range from infancy all the way to 60 years old. The mean age of symptoms is nine and a half years old, but the mean age of diagnosis is 15 years old. So there is a delay in diagnosis after initial presentation. In addition, by the time of the diagnosis, 20 to 50% of patients have already re reached advanced chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal failure. Our diagnostic testing for primary hyperoxaluria includes urine solute evaluation, so this can be random urines and urinalysis and urine microscopy. We perform 24-hour urine stone risk profiles in patients who are continent and toilet trained. And these results will then lead us to perform genetic screening. There is an excellent algorithm published for evaluation of patients for primary hyperoxyuria. The slide is divided into two sections. On the left, in patients with normal kidney function who present with stones or nephrocalcinosis in childhood, recurrent calcium oxalate stones or nephrocalcinosis in adulthood, or hyperoxaluria in the family, the next step would be to perform urine oxalate testing, either with a 24-hour urine for oxalate or in a child who is not continent or toilet trained yet, random urine for oxalate to creatinine ratio. If these are elevated above the normals, the next step would be to repeat the urine oxalate testing and in addition, perform the metabolite analysis for glycolate, glycerate, and HOG. If this is confirmed and they're above normal, the next step would be to ask the question on whether there are any secondary causes present such as malabsorption, gastrointestinal disease, high oxalate diet or low calcium diet or prematurity which would make you consider enteric hyperoxaluria. If any of these are present, you would then evaluate accordingly. If none of these are present, we would then perform genetic testing to screen for the common mutations seen in primary hyperoxaluria, AGXT gene, which is seen if the oxalate is elevated and the glycolate is elevated, although sometimes in primary hyperoxaluria type 1, only the oxalate is elevated. The GRHPR, if the oxalate is elevated and the glycerate is elevated, or the HOGA1 gene, if the oxalate is elevated and the HOG is elevated in the urine. There are profiles available where you can screen for all three genes as well at the same time. If none of these mutations are found and you still think the patient has a form of primary hyperoxaluria, you may consider research testing for novel genetic causes of primary hyperoxaluria. And there are also panels available for more genes related to kidney stone disease that may not be related to hyperoxaluria. Going back to the prior slide on the right side, if the patient presents with renal failure or renal insufficiency, and has an increased creatinine and calcium oxalate stones, calcium oxalate tissue deposits, or evidence of systemic oxalosis, or presents with nephrocalcinosis. In addition to performing the urine oxalate tests and the metabolites, we would also perform plasma oxalate levels. If both the oxalate levels are elevated and the plasma oxalate level is elevated, 
We would again ask whether there are any secondary causes or enteric hyperoxaluria risk factors, and if they are present, we would evaluate and treat accordingly. Again, if they are not present, we would perform genetic testing for the mutations associated with primary hyperoxaluria. In the clinic, we examine everybody's urine under the microscope to look at the sediment, the pH, and the specific gravity. As you can see from these pictures, in calcium oxalate stones and in primary hyperoxaluria on the left in the first panel, you may see the classic calcium oxalate dihydrate crystals. However, in primary hyperoxaluria, you may also see in the second panel calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals, and this is much less common in regular calcium oxalate stone disease than it is in primary hyperoxaluria. So if you see the calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals under the microscope, this should also be a trigger to consider the diagnosis of primary hyperoxaluria. In addition, if we're able to send a kidney stone analysis, either from a stone that the patient has passed on their own or after a procedure, then these are often calcium oxalate monohydrate stones instead of the more common calcium oxalate dihydrate stones. So a predominance of calcium oxalate monohydrate stone on analysis should also trigger you to consider the diagnosis of primary hyperoxaluria. During the testing of the urine, you can send a hyperoxaluria panel for more definitive testing for the metabolites we discussed in the algorithm. Primary hyperoxaluria is suggested if the oxalate and one of those metabolites is elevated. The metabolite that is elevated can also help you determine which type of primary hyperoxaluria to consider. So in type 1, the glycolate is often elevated, but in some cases, the oxalate only is elevated and the glycolate is not elevated. In type 2, the glycerate is elevated, and in type 3, the HOG is elevated. So again, this can be sent on a random urine to look at these metabolites in addition to oxalate on a particular panel. In a 24-hour urine, in addition to getting the 24-hour urine oxalate, we also look at other components that may contribute to kidney stone formation, including calcium, citrate, uric acid, creatinine, magnesium, and volume. And often these profiles will give us supersaturations, which tells us ongoing risk for stone formation, taking into consideration all of the things that are reported in the 24-hour urine. In primary hyperoxaluria, the 24-hour urine shows very high levels of oxalate. The 24-hour urines are also important for follow-up, and they are done at intervals when we ask the patient to increase their fluids or we start any preventative measure. That way we can determine whether our preventative measures are decreasing their ongoing stone risk and decreasing their calcium oxalate supersaturations. Here's an example of a 24-hour urine. You can see that there are two panels here, one in April of 2010 and one in June of 2010. The volume, the supersaturation for calcium oxalate, the urine calcium, the urine oxalate, the urine citrate, the urine supersaturation for calcium phosphate, as well as the pH and other parameters are all recorded. If you look on this sample, of 24-hour urine of the April of 2010 oxalate, it is 48. And this was a five-year-old child. So on first analysis, this doesn't look very elevated. If you look at the bottom where there's pediatric chemistry data, you will see that on that April 2010 24-hour urine, when the oxalate is corrected for body surface area, it is actually quite high at 100.8 milligrams per 1.73 meters squared. So it's really critical in pediatric patients to not look at the raw value of oxalate, but to correct this for body surface area so that you don't miss this diagnosis. This is an example of a random urine hyperoxaluria panel. You can see on this sample that the glycolate is elevated as well as the oxalate is elevated. 
So in this case, you would consider that this might be consistent with primary hyperoxaluria type 1 and the mutation in the AGXT gene. This is a panel that shows elevation in oxalate and in HOG. So in this case, you would consider analysis of the HOGA1 gene and diagnosis of primary hyperoxaluria type 3. Primary hyperoxaluria is an autosomal recessive disorder. That This means that each sibling of the index patient has a 25% chance of having primary hyperoxaluria. So it is critical after you have diagnosed your first patient that you screen all of the additional siblings with urine, oxalate, 24-hour urine, or random urines, as well as an ultrasound. This way you have the chance of actually making the diagnosis of primary hyperoxaluria potentially before the patient has any issues with kidney stones or chronic kidney disease. Current preventative treatments for primary hyperoxaluria are limited. Patients require extremely high fluid intake. This can be calculated as two to three liters per meter squared per day, or in adults, four liters a day, school-aged children, two to three liters a day, smaller children and infants, one to one and a half liters a day. And this is really difficult. This is a lot of fluid for small children and infants to take on a daily basis. And in infants, it may require an NG or gastrostomy tube in order to achieve these goals. The patients also feel like they stand out. They have to drink constantly throughout the entire day during their waking period. Pyridoxine can also be used in primary hyperoxaluria type 1 as it is a cofactor in the pathway for oxalate in the liver. About 30 to 50% of patients with PH1 respond to pyridoxine, often with a partial response, but this can also be a complete response with normalization of their urinary oxalate. Most responders are limited to published mutations such as the GLY170ARG and the other mutations listed on this slide. So patients who you think about primary hyperoxaluria should trial pyridoxine while you're waiting for the genetic evaluation to return, and you should assess their response to the pyridoxine by obtaining a follow-up urine oxalate after you've started the pyridoxine. The starting dose for pyridoxine is 5 to 10 milligrams per kilogram per day. And this is generally well tolerated unless the dose is pushed much higher. Solubility and crystallization inhibition agents are used, such as potassium citrate, magnesium oxide, or orthophosphate. The role of diet in primary hyperoxaluria and oxalate values is likely minimal because the endogenous oxalate production is so high. So we generally just recommend that patients avoid excessive dietary oxalate intake. The kidneys are the first organ to sustain damage from the hyperoxaluria, resulting in stones or nephrocalcinosis. Registry data on time to end stage kidney disease in patients with primary hyperoxaluria shows that in 20 to 50% of patients have reached the diagnosis of end stage renal disease actually at presentation with primary hyperoxaluria. By age 24 to 33, 50% of patients have reached end stage renal disease. By age 40, 57% of patients have reached end stage renal disease. And by age 60, 88% of patients have reached end-stage renal disease. As the GFR declines, this can result in systemic oxalate deposition. So as the GFR declines below 45 mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared, the renal excretion of oxalate cannot keep up with the oxalate production, and it becomes important then to follow plasma oxalate levels over time. The areas of the body that can have systemic oxalate deposition include the eyes, resulting in visual impairment, the heart, resulting in infiltrative cardiomyopathy with restrictive physiology and conductive disturbances, the bone, resulting in low trauma fractures, bone deformation, pain, and poor growth, as well as erythropoietin refractory anemia, and the skin that can result in nodules and ulcers.
Renal replacement therapy is indicated earlier than in other kidney diseases due to the rising plasma oxalate levels and this risk of systemic oxalosis. So when the plasma oxalate levels exceed 30, aggressive hemodialysis is required as the oxalate production continues to exceed the clearance capacity of the hemodialyzer. So this requires daily and longer dialysis. In addition to a renal replacement therapy, organ transplantation can be performed in primary hyperoxyria. Patients who are non-responsive to pyridoxine may receive a liver and kidney transplant. In patients who are pyridoxine responsive, an isolated kidney transplant can be considered. In our center, we perform bilateral nephrectomy at the time of transplant, as the native kidneys may be an ongoing source of oxalate. We perform aggressive hemodialysis after transplant while following serial serum oxalate levels until they fall to a safe range. And this protects the kidney transplant from oxalate deposits occurring while the serum oxalate levels remain high. Primary hyperoxyuria is a life-changing diagnosis for patients and their families. Their day-to-day -day intervention is very complex. They may require multiple procedures over their lives to treat kidney stones. They may have pain related to passage of a kidney stone or after a procedure. They have to take in daily high fluid intake, and as discussed, this may require a gastrostomy tube in infants. They have to take many pills during the day for the crystallization inhibitors. And they live with constant fear of making another stone or having kidney failure. And despite extraordinary efforts from the patients, their family, and their team, especially in primary hyperoxaluria type 1, primary hyperoxaluria can lead to kidney failure. This also is an intensive intervention requiring dialysis that is performed six to seven days a week for longer time periods and may require orange organ transplantation with the kidney and potentially the liver. This is just a treatment, and as you know, organ transplantation requires daily immunosuppressive medications, and the organ that is transplanted does not last indefinitely. So this may require repetitive transplants over their lifetime if the organ transplant fails. In our pediatric kidney stone clinic, our patients with primary hyperoxyuria are initially seen every three months. And then if they have a period of stability, we will advance them to have visits every six months. At each of these visits, they'll have a follow-up screening ultrasound. In addition, we ask them to repeat a 24-hour urine if we make any medical treatment changes and minimally once a year so we can make sure their profile continues to be reassuring. We follow their kidney function blood test yearly in those with preserved kidney function and more frequently in those with decreased kidney function. If they have decreased kidney function, then we will add the plasma oxalate levels as well. We ask that they keep up with all vaccines, including the flu shot, and they can use antiviral therapy if they get the flu or prophylactic antiviral therapy if they have a family flu exposure. If the child cannot keep fluids down, we ask that they come to the hospital for an emergency room visit to get IV fluids so that we can prevent dehydration, acute stone formation, and acute kidney injury. In summary, primary hyperoxyuria should be considered in patients presenting with kidney stones when they're very young, have family members who might have primary hyperoxyuria present with nephrocalcinosis, or reduced kidney function in the setting of kidney stones. The primary hyperoxyuria diagnostic testing framework includes analysis of oxalate and its metabolites in the urine, as well as genetic testing. Current preventative treatments include high fluid intake, pyridoxine, crystallization inhibiting agents, and minimal dietary changes. Despite extraordinary efforts from the patients, family, and the team, especially in primary hyperoxyluria type 1. Primary hyperoxyluria can lead to kidney failure. Treatments for progressive disease include aggressive dialysis and organ transplantation of the kidney and or the liver.
Today we presented information about primary hyperoxyuria, the diagnosis, the management, and the progression. Now we're going to review a few specific questions about primary hyperoxyuria. The biological markers of primary hyperoxyuria are useful in making the diagnosis of primary hyperoxyuria. So understanding the pathway of AGXT or GRHPR or HOGA1 will lead to understanding why the different metabolites might be elevated in the urine on the random hyperoxyuria panel. So we talked about earlier that not only the oxalate in the urine might be elevated, but also the glycolate or the glycerate or the HOG. Primary hyperoxyluria, enteric hyperoxyluria, and general calcium oxalate urinary stone disease have several differences. Enteric hyperoxyluria can result from many different gastrointestinal disorders that result in fat malabsorption. Generally, fat binds to the free calcium in the small intestine when you have malabsorption, and this results in more free oxalate that then presents to the colon. And in the colon, it is then absorbed through the intestine into the bloodstream, and then it is excreted by the kidney. In addition, in enteric hyperoxyuria, bile salts and fatty acids can increase the permeability of the intestine, and this also facilitates oxalate reabsorption. In calcium oxalate general stone disease, this can be multifactorial and can result from medications that the patient takes, dietary factors, intercurrent medical disorders, other genetic disorders, and it can also be idiopathic. So for example, high salt diets can be associated with calcium stone formation, poor fluid intake, primary hyperparathyroidism, renal tubular acidosis, or use of Lasix. The main challenges for the diagnosis of primary hyperoxyuria are related to recognition. So I think that increasing awareness of this diagnosis, how to make the diagnosis, and treating the patient is really critical. Um, and starting from the beginning to evaluate a patient when they initially present with kidney stone disease is really important. So measuring urine 24-hour solutes or random urine solutes is critical to making the diagnosis. So I think the main challenges are for primary hyperoxyuria are related to education of the caretaker, the physician, and empowering the patient to ask questions about why they have kidney stone disease. We recommend that patients are evaluated for primary hyperoxyuria if they present with kidney stones at a young age if they have a predominance of calcium oxalate monohydrate stones compared to the more common calcium oxalate dihydrate stones, if they have recurrent kidney stones, or they have consanguinity. In addition, we recommend that siblings who have kidney stones are evaluated for primary hyperoxyuria. Lastly, patients who present with abnormal renal function in the setting of kidney stones or abnormal renal function with signs or symptoms of systemic oxalosis should also be evaluated for primary hyperoxyuria. There can be significant variability in patients' presentation with primary hyperoxyuria. The most severe form presents as infantile oxalosis with often abnormal kidney function or end-stage renal disease in an infant. Patients can present later on in childhood or adulthood with recurrent kidney stones, nephrocalcinosis, or abnormal kidney function. In my experience, I've had several patients present with urinary tract infection and on evaluation for their urinary tract infection on an ultrasound, kidney stones were found. And so these patients, although the urinary tract infection may not have anything to do with their primary hyperoxyuria, their stones should also be evaluated for primary hyperoxyuria. There really isn't a typical profile of patients with primary hyperoxyuria. 
So I think it's important to think of this diagnosis and then evaluate the patient for this diagnosis. Patients can have their organ systems involved in primary hyperoxaluria once they start to have abnormal renal function. A systemic oxalosis can involve the heart, the skin, the bones, and the eyes. We are now going to present some patient videos and these patients and their families will share their experience with primary hyperoxaluria. The first video is the Skinner family. This family has several children with primary hyperoxaluria, including an infant who was affected with severe primary hyperoxaluria. Three of the four of our children were born with primary hyperoxaluria type 1. PH1 is an issue with the liver. Oxalate building up in the kidney causes kidney failure and it also deposits into other areas of their body like their eyes, their bones, and can just do internal damage. Claire was diagnosed with PH1 when she was two months old. They found out that her kidneys had stopped working. It was obviously a, a huge shock to our family and her road ahead indeed proved very challenging. They started her on peritoneal dialysis. She didn't eat for the first maybe four years of her life. Peritoneal dialysis wasn't enough. We wanted to start Claire on hemodialysis. She got worse because of the oxalate and the dialysis. Her bones started to get extremely weak. She broke both of her legs, she broke her collarbone. I was starting to deposit into her eyes, or, and it's permanent damage to her eyes, in her heart, just all over her body. Her body was absolutely in need of this life-saving transplant. We were doing all we could, but it wasn't going to be enough. If she didn't get this, a transplant soon, how much longer can she hold on? It was about 94 days from the time that she got placed on the list until the transplant went through. It's hard when you don't see that light at the end of the tunnel, but when you can, just keep the course, keep that hope alive. I think that we communicate our diagnosis quite well in pediatrics to the children and the families, and we involve the children very early on in their diagnosis and in their care. In pediatrics, families do a really good job with primary hyperoxaluria and managing the high fluid intake and getting the children to take the required medications. This is really important to the families because they're afraid of making more stones and needing more procedures or having a progression in their kidney function. I find that the primary hyperoxaluria community also rally around each other, and this really helps the families and the children. So the Oxalosis Hyperoxaluria Foundation, or OHF, is very involved in, in hooking up families with other families, in having meetings for professionals and families where Families can meet other families, children can meet other children, and families can meet the professionals who take care of them and do research um, in the field. So I think the families, along with the OHF, educate and empower the families, as well as help the families to fundraise for research in the field of primary hyperoxaluria. Patients can present as infants with primary hyperoxaluria. They may present in the emergency room with acute renal failure without a diagnosis. They may present with an abnormal ultrasound in that setting. So it's quite important to think about this diagnosis in an infant who presents with acute renal failure. In addition, it's not uncommon for families to have more than one child with primary hyperoxaluria. 
it's an autosomal recessive disorder, and hence each child has a 25% chance of having primary hydroxyurea. So each sibling should be evaluated as well. The concerns for caregivers with children who have primary hydroxyurea include recurrent kidney stones causing pain or the requirement for surgical procedures, a risk of kidney failure developing over their life, the risk of having a kidney transplant or a liver transplant. The families have a high fluid intake requirement, and sometimes this can be a battle between the families and the children over their life. And then sometimes the hospitalization inhibition medications can taste bad in the liquid form or involve large pills that the children have to swallow, and this can be difficult for the families as well. The second video we'll be sharing with you is the Cataldo family. The Cataldo family includes a young adult who has primary hyperoxyluria, who underwent a liver and kidney transplant, and his mother and one of his siblings is also present. When I was first being diagnosed with kidney failure, I was laying in the hospital bed and she was next to me. You know, she, she spent every night in the hospital next to me. And I just said to her, you know, I'm just gonna need your help to get through this. And I knew that she would help me any way she could. It was very difficult seeing my son go through this journey. He was in kidney failure. He had to start dialysis the next day and then he was on dialysis for six days a week. We were going through the process of being evaluated for a transplant for a kidney and a liver, and that was a very, very difficult time. The hardest part of watching my brother go through the transplant process was just seeing him in pain, seeing him get his freedom taken away from him, his ability to do small things that I take for granted. Me and my mother always had a strong relationship. I guess the most traumatic experience I've gone through in my life, and she was at every doctor's visit. She'd help me get to dialysis every morning. She'd help make me lunch for when I got home. She was everything to me as a caregiver. As a parent, you're a caregiver, and I don't think that ever stops, no matter how old they are, because you'll do anything for your child. So to me, it wasn't a burden. I just wanted my child to be well and happy as, as best as he could possibly be. My advice would be to just keep moving forward, to accept the support that so many people want to give you. It just helps to know that people will help you in any way they can. Try to stay positive. Reach out and speak to somebody who maybe struggled with the same situation. Sometimes I think the recipients of the care don't realize how important they are to other people in their lives and how much they help you as well. When I have patients initially diagnosed with primary hyperoxyuria, we spend a long time at that visit understanding primary hyperoxyuria and making sure the family is aware of what the diagnosis is what the treatment is, and what the risks are for the future. In addition, I provide the family with safe places to look on the internet. This would include sites such as the Rare Kidney Stone Consortium site um, with the section on primary hyperoxyuria for patient education, as well as the Oxalosis Hyperoxyuria Foundation or the OHF. The OHF is a great resource for a newly diagnosed patient because they can provide support and they can provide other patients for the family to talk to and other parents for the parents to talk to. And I find this is very helpful for the families who are newly diagnosed. Patients may present an emergency room with primary hyperoxyuria with acute kidney stone symptoms, such as pain in their flank and renal colic with vomiting or blood in the urine. They can um, present 
and need a procedure after we've seen them in clinic and they have a new stone and their urologist has decided with them that they need to have a procedure. So they may have a hospitalization or just an outpatient visit um, for a procedure and then go home. And they may need to come to the hospital if they have an illness and they can't keep fluids down. As we don't want them to get dehydrated. So we ask them to contact us for any illness with vomiting or something where they can't swallow well, where they can't take their regular fluid intake. And that way they can come in and get IV fluids until they're able to take their oral fluids better. Thank you for watching this exhibitor spotlight at the Kidney Week 2020 reimagined. And I hope that you have learned about primary hyperoxaluria, its evaluation, treatment, and progression. Please fill out the evaluation form by scanning the QR code on the slide with your phone camera. We would appreciate your feedback.